This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. This week we have Krzysztof Gajos, uh, whose name I've been practicing pronouncing. It's Polish. And he's going to talk today about his work on automatically generating user interfaces. I invited Krzysztof to come here. I've been a, a fan of his work for, for several years now, and, and we teach it in the, the grad HCI class. And the thing for me that I think is particularly interesting about his work is that for a long time now, user interfaces have been made by hand, where somebody specifies an instance of a UI, and it's the, the designerly art is in creating an instance of a UI. And what Christoph's work explores is, is automatically generating UIs. And so the role of the designer shifts from being somebody that makes an actual instance of a user interface to somebody that sets up the ways in which a computer will su subsequently decide to create a user interface. And so the designerly control in this new world is very different. And uh, Christoph has a really strong technical background and, is, and has come up with some excellent techniques for the machinery that makes that actually work. And so I think this is a, a really the general belief in, in Christoph's work about both uh, shifting the role of designers and about looking at how we can use decision theory and, and other uh, well machine learning and techniques like that to optimize user interface experiences is, I think, a, a really exciting direction. And I'm sure you'll all agree. Thank you, Scott. Um, so again, my name is Krzysztof Gajos. I am currently at the University of Washington, but not for too much longer. Uh, and my talk is on automatically gener generating personalized uh, user interfaces. Uh, the motivation for this talk you probably will have heard before from other people doing uh, various types of adaptive user interfaces, but it's still worth re recapping. Um, because notice that today's user interfaces are typically designed on the assumption that they're going to be used in a, in a very particular context. Namely, th that they're going to be used by an able-bodied person, somebody who is sitting in a stable and warm environment, and who, who has typical perceptual and cognitive capabilities, and who is using a very narrow set of input and output devices. Uh, yet, more and more, we find ourselves in situations where these assumptions do not hold. We may be using a very different types of devices. We may be recovering from a, uh, from a temporary injury. We may have a permanent uh, impairment. We may be traveling on a jostling bus. Uh, or we may be trying out a novel type of interaction, such as, for example, trying to control a uh, mouse cursor with a laser pointer. Uh, in all of these situations, we are presented with exactly the same user interface, and it is our job to adapt ourselves the best we can to the you know, requirements of that particular user interface. Um, and while that user interface often is appropriate for the particular narrow context for which it was designed, in all of the other situations, it's either hard or even impossible to use effectively. Um, so my work has addressed uh, a number of issues in this space. But in this talk, I want to focus particularly on, uh, on the situation of people with, uh, with motor impairments. And this is a very diverse population, one that relies on a, on a wide variety of very different input devices and where people's uh, motor capabilities differ widely on, uh, on individual basis. And something that I want to point out over here is that um, assistive technology, so the exist, existing approaches to uh, helping these populations be effective with computers kind of uh, start out on the assumption that it's these people that have to adapt themselves to the current state of the interaction technology. Whereas my belief is that we can turn things around. We can adapt the software to the tasks, devices, preferences, and abilities of, uh, of, of these people by automatically generating user interfaces that are optimized for, for a person's individual uh, needs and capabilities. And in this talk, I'll also show you some evidence uh, 
that um, such automatically generated user interfaces actually do improve uh, performance and, um, and, and satisfaction, especially of people with motor impairments. So briefly, I'm going to present three technical systems in this talk. Uh, my SAPL system, which uh, provides the basis of this talk, uh, it uses decision theoretic optimization to automatically generate user interfaces that are adapted to the uh, physical characters, characteristics of, of a device. Um, and then my Ornold system, which uses um, a set of preference illustration techniques to build a model of a person's subjective view of how user interfaces should be generated. So this relates to what Scott was talking about. It basically allows a sophisticated user to tell the system what, what a good user interface should look like. The system captures this knowledge and then is able to reuse it later to generate, generate novel user interfaces in the style of, of that person. And then as a complement to this kind of, to, to, to Arnold's system, which kind of captures subjective uh, reactions of a person to, to a user interface, my, my, my next system builds an objective model of a, per, of a person's uh, motor capabilities and then generate, uh, and then, which then allows SAPL to automatically generate user interfaces that are predicted to be the fastest for a particular person to use. Um, and as a, as a small note, I'm also going to show how a similar set of techniques can be used to uh, automatically generate user interfaces adapted to people's vision <laughs> capabilities as well. And uh, just to convince you that I didn't waste my last five years, I'll show, uh, present you the results of, of a summative user study. Um, so let's start with SAPL and automatically generated, generating user interfaces adapted to, to the uh, sp specifics of a particular device. Um, so I'm not the first person to, to do automatic user interface generation. People have done it before, but usually in a very domain-specific manner. And the reason why people took this narrow approach is because they tended to use um, uh, an, a rule-based approach to automatically generating user interfaces. That approach relies on, on a human engineer interviewing human designers and eliciting rules and heuristics for how they build successful user interfaces and then codifying that knowledge in, in a large number of machine-readable rules. Um, the one system that tried to comprehensively capture all of the rules to, it, with, the, with the goal of generating user interfaces for, for any, any domain captured uh, 3,700 rules. Um, and notice that while this may be an appropriate approach in some situations, we are looking not for a system that can generate user interfaces in just one particular situation. We are looking for actually a large family of automatic user interface generators that can be adapted to the needs and preferences of different users. So we cannot afford to go through this rule elicitation process for every, every context. So uh, that approach uh, is not quite scalable for, for, what, for what I want to accomplish. So in contrast, I cast user interface generation as an optimization problem. One where you can think of it as that my system basically scours the entire design space of user interfaces for, for a particular uh, application and then uses some quantitative metric of goodness of these user interfaces to pick the best one. So to kind of illustrate the entire architecture, my SAPL system takes three inputs, a device model that, uh, that uh, encodes the capabilities and limitations of, of a particular physical device, a functional specification of, of, of an application that specifies what types of information need to be exchanged between the application and the user, and the cost function, which is this quantitative metric of quality that drives the, uh, that drives the, uh, the process of selecting the best user interface from the space. And SAPL combines these three inputs on the fly and automatically, and on the client side, and at runtime creates a user interface that is appropriate for a particular application, for a particular device, and for a particular context as, is as encoded in the cost function. So in the next couple of minutes, I would like to kind of go through these three inputs in a little bit more detail. Um, so the functional specification, uh, I represent it hierarchically, uh, hierarchically um, with the, the leaf nodes of here corresponding, uh, be being represented by very specific data types, such as booleans, integers, strings, uh, and so on. And those, those nodes get represented by very concrete widgets in the user interface, such as buttons, sliders, checkboxes, and so on. Um, whereas the interior nodes, 
correspond to the semantic groupings of these elements. And in a concrete user interface, they get represented as uh, organizational or, or layout uh, choices, such as tab panes splitting things into separate windows or just aligning things vertically or horizontally. The device model primarily specifies what types of graphical or other capabilities a device has for representing different types of information. And it can also include uh, information about device's limitations, primarily the size of its screen. Now, the cost function uh, takes as an input a user interface or a fraction of a user interface and returns a number that somehow corresponds to, to the goodness of that user interface. <coughs> what number specifically it returns is not as important as the fact that these numbers can be used for a comparison. So as long as the, the best user interface by some metric returns, get, gets, gets the smallest number, um, that cost function represents our, our desires uh, appropriately. Um, and because it will be critical for some of the algorithmic choices that we make later, I, I want to show you um, just how this cost function is factored. So this left side of the equation basically says that the cost of a specific rendering of a, of, of a functional specification, a rendering of a spe specification basically means a concrete user interface. So the cost of this user interface is, uh, is computed as a sum over all of the ele elements in that specification. So you remember that tree structure? Each, each element in this tree structure is assigned a particular uh, 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 interface design choice. So we evaluate each one of these design choices separately, um, one by one, and compute the entire cost as a sum of these choices. And then the cost of, a, of, a, of any single assignment is further computed in terms of, of weighted factors. These factors are, are little functions that tell us about the presence, absence, or intensity of certain interface property. For example, whether, whether or not a Boolean is represented by, by a checkbox or, or two radio buttons. And these factors get each assigned weights. And the important thing is that the entire behavior of, of the generator can be specified by, by an appropriate choice of weights. And to contrast it with the previous approaches, SAPL relies on about 50 different factors, therefore 50 different weights, rather than 3,700 different rules. So you will notice that uh, SAPL takes dramatically less knowledge as input to, to generate user interfaces than the prior approaches. Yes, sir? Uh, you, you, cannot, you, you cannot reason of, about other assignment, assignments, that's correct. So for example, you cannot, you cannot assign a cost to, to the general shape of the user interface. So you cannot, for example, penalize user interfaces that are very skinny and long. In practice, it ends up not being a problem, but, but it is a limitation. And we'll over, overcome it in the, in the last part of the talk. So what's happening here is that we're, in, with, in comparison to the previous approaches, we are making a computation versus knowledge trade-off. The previous approaches tended to generate user interfaces in a, uh, in a greedy manner, making one and largely irreversible decision at, at each step in the design process, whereas my system uh, kind of conceptually searches the entire space of user interfaces and then picks the best one. So it's allowed, it's allowed to make a mistake. It doesn't have to know that if it makes a particular set of choices, for example, always choosing the largest widgets, it will eventually run out of space. It doesn't have to uh, anticipate this a priori. It can actually make that mistakes, run out of space, backtrack, and then do something else. But the fact that we, we now have less knowledge to provide the system means that the system is much more personalizable and we'll exploit it in later parts of the talk. Um, I am actually not the first person to consider optimization in uh, user interfaces, however, Previous approaches only used it for the layout of the elements in the user interfaces, whereas my, my system does much more. It does layout, but it also, in the same optimization process, chooses what, um, what widgets to use to represent any part of functionality, and also the high-level organization structure. So whether or not to put everything into a single view, whether put it into separate tab panes, or whether even to split it into separate windows. So all of these decisions are made in a single optimization process. Um, for those of you who are interested, um, the, uh, this is a, a discrete optimization process, so we quite naturally use the branch and bound search algorithm. Um, 
that algorithm critically relies on an admissible heuristic that kind of guides the direction of the search. And um, for, for us, it's the lower bound on, on the cost of the parts of the user interface that we haven't built yet. Um, and because it's a, it's a constraint optimization process, so that there is a constraint satisfaction component to it, we actually use the, the full constraint propagation, which drastically reduces the amount of time that the, that the system needs. So these are details for people who are interested. Uh, now, how good is it? Um, there is a reason why people did not use optimization before to, to do the entire user interface generation problem, because the search space is actually huge. Even for a sim very simple user interface, um, you, you get hundreds of billions of possible user interfaces uh, that you have to search through. So if you were to search through them naively, you would need uh, hundreds of years. Uh, and my advisor objected to that. Um, the branch and bound search, which allows us to, to eliminate many of the options that are probably suboptimal, uh, reduces this time to hours or days. Um, adding forward checking to it, which is a limited version of constraint propagation, reduces this time to minutes. And with full constraint propagation, we can actually generate user interface in a matter of seconds. And I'll show you examples in a second. Um, now, how good is it? These are some examples of very simple user interfaces generated by the system. And unlike rule-based systems, um, my system can, without any modification, generate a user interface for devices with very different screen sizes. It basically creates the best thing that will fit in a particular amount of screen real estate. It can also naturally generate interfaces for very different types of devices, like, like, uh, like a touch panel, a web browser, PDA, laptop computer, and a web cell phone just by, by switching the device models and the cost functions. And this little demo app, uh, application is meant to show you just how quickly the system can regenerate uh, novel user interfaces for, uh, for, for different screen sizes and uh, screen shapes. Um, and the, the system is appropriate not only for, for these relatively simple applications that I've showed you before, but it also works well with uh, you know, data intensive applications such as uh, email clients and you know, it can combine a number of different windows and user interface components. It also works reasonably well with uh, kind of in interaction intensive applications such as this interactive map. Um, and there's one example that um, perhaps will uh, appeal to you. So this is Microsoft Ribbon, Some, uh, comes from Office 2007. It's a very interesting interface innovation. And you, you can see that it has size adaptation built into it. As you, as you shrink and expand the, the width of the window, some parts of the of that user interface uh, gets either redrawn or even collapsed to, into these small panels. The trick here is that um, the adaptation here is hand-coded. Hand so basically, several different versions of the ribbon had to be designed for, for different uh, screen sizes. And as a very unfortunate consequence of this design choice, ribbon is not customizable. Because there are several hand-coded designs for, for the same set of functionality, if you wanted to customize it, you would actually have to customize all versions. and. Um, and the, the design choice that Microsoft made was not to make customization possible. In contrast, if you were to implement uh, Ribbon in SAPL, SAPL naturally su supports the type of adaptations that you already have uh, in Ribbon. So it ad adapt adapts to size things, redraw and uh, appear in panels. But in SAPL, people can actually, for example, choose um, which of the panels should be shrunk and which should be expanded. So this is what the user is doing over here. The user chose the drawing panel to be expanded. But also, users can uh, f customize the functionality of the, of the user interface by copying, moving, and deleting elements that will uh, either single elements or the entire, the entire com containers. And, and the adapted ribbon Still, customize, uh, still adapts to a size just like the, just like the original. So um, I, 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 I find this point actually somewhat interesting because this is an example of, of a situation where an, an automatically created user interface actually gives users more control over the interaction than a manually created one. So to summarize, to summarize this part of the user interface, um, I showed you how to cast user interface generation as an optimization problem. 
I showed you that, it, that this optimization problem, although quite daunting, can actually be solved exactly and very quickly. And hopefully I demonstrated uh, that, that, that this approach is uh, applicable to a broad range of devices and application types. So now I want to move to the part of the of the stock that is about making this process uh, personalizable. So uh, first, how do we adapt this this process to to people's preferences? Specifically, ideally, to 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 the preferences of people who actually understand how to design user interfaces well for various novel devices, and who can kind of build a version of the system that that can be shared with with other users. So I mentioned earlier that Sapple's behavior is uh, entirely uh, encoded in the appropriate choice of, of the values of 50 different weights. But um, the, the right choos choosing these weights by hand is actually a very tedious and error-prone process because the values of these weights intricately uh, interact with one another. So because direct manipulation is not a particularly helpful approach over here, I looked for, um, for an alternative. So we're going to augment our architecture diagram with two important components. First, we're going to add the user. And then we're going to add the all node system, which through a small set of preference illustration interactions with the user, where it uh, collects a person's feedback on, the conc on concrete examples of user interfaces, builds a model of that person's preferences, and turns it into a cost function that can later be used by SAPL to generate user interfaces, novel user interfaces, in the style uh, that this person is predicted to prefer. Uh, this, is, this I found to be a very interesting uh, problem to work on because uh, it combines two sets of requirements. It combines interaction requirements. We have to design uh, this preference solicitation interaction in such a way that uh, the responses are very easy and fast for, for people to produce. And we have to come up with learning algorithms that kind of con uh, convert this collected information from the user and turn it into appropriate set of weights in a way that is correct, in that it really represents what the person said, and robust uh, in the sense that it will still build a reasonably well model, even if uh, some of the responses from the user are internally inconsistent. So starting with the interactions, I already hinted that SAPL supports uh, a wide variety of different customization interactions. So for example, uh, specifically, people can right click on any part of the user interface and say that they do not like how that particular part uh, has been rendered. And in that case, um, SAPL will regenerate user interface around the, the kind of improvement request that the person made. So in this case, the, the system started by you know, representing volume by, with a combo box. The user said, no, I actually really want a volume slider, a slider over here. So a user get, gets, gets a new user interface, but what we get out of it is a preference statement. In this case, the person told us that they prefer, prefer a slider over a combo box. Um, so this type of interaction is, is a very desirable because it exploits what is naturally occurring uh, in the interaction of a person with the system. And it is very effective when the system is already doing a reasonably good job and a person wants to tweak it or kind of incrementally improve it or incrementally ad adjust it to their needs. Yes, sir. When you say natural, I, I, I have the feeling that somehow it's, it's watching the, the user do something and figuring it out. It's, I mean, it's, what's the feedback cycle? By natural, what, what, what I mean over here is that a person will engage in this customization interaction if they are dissatisfied with the user interfaces that they get. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, and let us assume that they do. Uh, uh, but the, the downside of this interaction is that if, if we're starting totally from scratch and the system is not yet producing satisfactory user interfaces, it would be extremely tedious. And because it is entirely user-driven, it actually does not guarantee that the user will explore the entire space of possible design choices and, and therefore will not necessarily give, give the system all of the information it needs to generate all of the possible future user interfaces. So as a complement 
I just like sliders, or is that saying I like sliders for these sorts of things? Uh, we don't know what these sorts of things are, so we only capture that preference kind of in isolation of the particular context. And uh, it is a slightly dangerous thing to do, but it turns out to, to uh, work reasonably well. I mean, the trouble is that we cannot really capture the semantics of the interaction. We, we, we don't know that there is a difference between the volume control and the light level control. To a person, the, the semantic context of these two adjustments, of, of these two interactions, are very, very different. To, to my system, there isn't. Um, and, and it turns out, uh, in the later studies, we saw that we're still able to capture almost all of the preferences that people cared about. No, so in this interaction, I do not, but there is another. So um, I, I'll point it out in, in this other type of interaction uh, in a second. But people can make two types of preference statements. They can make kind of a preference statements in isolation or the Ceteris Paribus statements that say, in general, everything else being equal, I prefer a slider to a combo box, which is really what the person over, over here said. But what, what happened afterwards is that the system actually totally redrew a user interface and there were some ripple, ripple effects. The new user interface was actually different. So there is actually a second interaction that a person can engage in and say, actually, the resulting user interface is worse than what I started with. In that case, that, and the second interaction actually incorporates context. The, the system could watch the person having difficulty with a dexterous act, such as a slider, and it could, it could put down a, uh, put into a box because uh, it's, it's much easier to hit them. And I'll try to address this in the next part of the talk. <coughs> There's a model of user interactions as opposed to just a, uh, And that's precisely what I do in the next part when I adjust the people's motor capabilities. So. An alternative to the user-driven interaction here is the system-driven interaction, one where the system actually presents people with pairs of, of possible user interfaces that are functionally equivalent, but, that's, but aesthetically different. So again, user now can respond to these things and say, you know, I have a preference for one over the other. And this is an example of, an, of a query in isolation. But as I've mentioned, sometimes when, when uh, when a person in general prefers sliders over combo boxes, in context, when using sliders means that some of the functionality will disappear into different tab panes, a person actually may prefer this user interface just because it puts all of the functionality together. So we, we capture, we, we collect both the set of paribus and the con in context responses from the, from the user. Um, and the, the kind of interaction properties of, of, of this technique are complementary to, to those of the, uh, of the, of the user-driven technique. Um, now, we, we still have very important challenges over here, which is how do we turn these responses into weights, and then also how do we come up with the right questions uh, w in the, in the system-driven uh, uh, elicitation. And I'll just give you an, a very, very quick insight on how we turn the user responses into, into weights. So when, when, we get a, get, when, when we get a preference statement from a person, for example, I, I prefer sliders to combo boxes, we can you know, represent it in terms of costs. Uh, things that are better have lower costs, so you know, sliders should have a lower cost than combo box. We rewrite it in, you know, in the format of, of our cost function, which we've seen earlier. And uh, it's very help, helpful to consider this problem in, a, in graphical terms. Notice that what we want to find is the right set of the, these weights u. So we are dealing with this multidimensional space uh, where each of the dimensions corresponds to one of these, um, one of these weights. And notice that any time a person makes a preference statement, that preference statement corresponds to a hyperplane that goes through the space. And all of the points on one side of that hyperplane satisfy the preference statement, and the points on the other side do not. And when you collect enough of these preference statements, you end up building this convex polytope in this space where any point inside this polytope satisfies all of the preference statements collected thus far. And intuitively, what we want is not just any point inside this polytope, but one that is closest to the center. And this is what our algorithm ends up doing. But I'll skip the details. The important thing is that, the that our algorithm is fast, and it is important because when you, when you try to create 
when you try to come up with the next question to ask the user, you actually need to first recompute the new set of weights based on all of the uh, all, all of the responses that you've collected thus far, and then come up with the next question. So you, you really need this algorithm to be fast in order for the entire uh, interaction to, to proceed at, at smooth pace. So this is what this interaction looks like in practice. Um, you can see that this system is able to recompute the weights and, and generate questions uh, at, well, interactive speeds. And it actually learns reasonably fast. Um, so this is what a user interface might look like when the system, when all of the weights are set to zero. After a few responses, it improves, improves, improves. And after 20 responses in this particular case, it generates reasonably good user interfaces. So <clears throat> how good is it? Um, both experts and users needed only 20 to 25 minutes to uh, to teach the system a, a complete cost function that reasonably well represented their, uh, their preferences. Um, can you go back one slide for a second? I'm curious, can you offer an intuition as to, I'm looking at the light bank on the, well, the left is overloaded here, but the left hand side of the interface and the fact that we only get to see one control at a time. And in the final UI, you get to see all three controls. Well, and why, can you offer an intuition as to why your system didn't do the final thing at the beginning? Um, because all, all the choices were equally good. So you, you can see that this is actually a tab thing, but one that, that didn't fit on the screen. So the system basically had, that there was no difference to it between laying things out in a, in a horizontal fashion or putting them in a tab thing. Just happened to be a random choice that it made. Uh, and it was good enough because it fit on the screen. So basically, in this case, the, the system had absolutely no guidance. It could have produced any number of user interfaces, and what it actually produced is, uh, is, 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 is a matter of accident. Um, so it's fast to use. Um, and the, this time breaks down into you know, 30 to 50 system-driven uh, interactions followed by five to 15 user-driven interactions. Um, the important thing is that experts who have previ previously used, uh, developed in SAPL and generated cost functions by hand were two to three times faster with the system. And also, the quality of the user interfaces generated by the cost functions generated by, through this interactive process, were were better by the admission of the experts than the quality of the user interfaces uh, generated with the cost function that they designed by hand. So we, we, we are both faster and generate products of higher quality. Uh, and on the algorithmic side, the algorithm was able to, to, conver uh, to converge very, very quickly to, to kind of target cost functions, uh, even w in the presence of a uh, substantial amount of noise. Uh, so to summarize this, um, I created a preference solicitation system where I, uh, you know, selected uh, interactions that were ap appropriate for for, uh, for for this type for this type of a system. Um, I didn't kind of tell you why why the selection of the interactions was a big big deal over here, but many of the previous systems in this space uh, tried to elicit similar types of information from people by asking people to either rate outcomes on on continuous scales or rank order large numbers of outcomes. And it turns out that in neither of these cases, people are, that in both of these cases, it's very hard for people to actually produce an answer. And also, uh, the answers are inconsistent. If you ask people the same questions over and over again in different stages, uh, at different points of, in time, that they'll actually give you uh, inconsistent answers. And some of the answers may actually not even be transitive. So coming up with the interactions that, that were fast and robust for, for, for people to respond to, uh, was, a, was an important challenge here. And the interesting thing is that because previous work kind of focused on, on these other types of interactions, there were no existing algorithms that were able to uh, take the types of responses that we collected over here and, um, and turn them into a set of weights. So my contribution here was also to develop a new algorithm, both for learning the set of weights from, from the collected responses and for generating a question, an optimal set of questions for, for people to respond to. Okay, so moving on uh, to, to address your concerns. Um, 
what if we want to, instead of looking at people's subjective preferences, want to focus on people's actual capabilities and want to build user interfaces that are easiest for people to use. So just to make it clear, when, when we design user interfaces, we focus on a number of different dimensions. We, there, there is the perceptual effort, there's the cognitive effort, there's the motor effort, there's the aesthetics and there are others. Um, and I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that I'm focusing here particularly on the needs of people with motor impairments. So for populations that, that are particularly challenging along one of these dimensions, it does make sense to focus on user interfaces that emphasize one of these dimensions over all of the others. So in this part of the talk, I'm going to show you user interfaces that are uh, easiest to use. And as a particular metric of ease of use, I'm going to use the speed of use. So basically, my cost function here is going to be the predicted time that the person would take to perform a typical set of tasks with a particular application given different types of the user interface. So my cost function will take a user interface and will tell me back how long it thinks a user will take with that particular user interface to perform a typical set of tasks with the underlying application. So going back to the architecture diagram, we're going to add one more component, an ability modeler, something that will engage with the user in a one-time one, one set of diagnostic tasks and then build a model of how well this person can control the mouse cursor and then generate a cost function that uh, adequately represents that person's capabilities. Um, so to start with, how do we represent a person's capabilities? Um, I invited eight users to my preliminary uh, study. Three of them uh, had permanent motor impairments. Four of them uh, were users of unusual uh, in input devices. And two of them were able-bodied able and used typical devices. I asked them to perform an, a number of uh, pretty standard tasks, the, the reciprocal pointing tasks, uh, dragging operations, uh, list selection operations, and obviously I varied the target sizes and the distances. Um, and here are some results. Um, on the x-axis you see a distance to a target, on the y-axis a time a person took, and each color line corresponds to a different target, uh, target size. Um, and for this particular user you can see that for very small target size her performance uh, had huge variance, and it improved as the target sizes in increased to 25 pixels and beyond, and then the improvement stopped. And you, you will also notice that this person's performance was largely insensitive to the, to the distance to the target. Um, I, this is a pretty, a kind of, a, a, a particularly striking example here. This was an eye tracking user, so she could move, shift her gaze very, very rapidly from one part of the screen, but had trouble acquiring uh, very small targets. Uh, and unsurprisingly, her performance was very poorly modeled by, by Fitzlaw. Are, these, uh, are each of those points on the graph on the left more than one data point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. they're averaged over a few dozen. Um, so we really couldn't capture this, this lack of dependence on distance and this strong dependence on, on the target size and also very nonlinear dependence on the target size with Fitzlaw. So I decided to, to look for something else, and somebody has already promised to give me a hard time about it. Um, so what I did instead was to build another system that uh, automatically builds a custom regression model for each, each user by automatically selecting a set of features that are appropriate for modeling that particular person's performance, and then automatically train that regression model. And both in average and in worst case, that model was able to much better capture uh, people's capabilities. Uh, so th this is what we ended up using uh, throughout, our, throughout our system. Uh, now, given that we can predict how long a person will perform various actions in the user interface, how do we actually generate user interfaces that are predicted to be fastest? Um, turns out to be a pretty challenging problem. Um, some people have done it in the past, but again, only for layout, and my system uh, as you know, does much more. Besides layout, it does widgets, structure, but in this case, it does one more thing. I, add, I added one more access to the design space, which is the size of the interactors. Like, especially when you watch people with imp impaired dexterity, you will notice that a lot of their problems stem from the fact that they cannot acquire the extremely small targets uh, in, most of, in most of the widgets that we use on the, on, uh, in our widget toolkits today. So I actually 
uh, parameterized my widget toolkit so that it would allow me to uh, uh, continuously change the, the sizes of all of the clickable elements uh, in those interactors. So that's one challenge. We have a much larger design space now. And there is a second challenge. Like at the beginning of the talk, I told you that I relied on a particular factoring of the cost function such that the cost could be computed as a sum of the costs of individual assignments uh, of kind of widgets or layout decisions to, to individual nodes in the, uh, in the functional specification. But notice that if we use time as our cost function, how can you compute time a person will take to navigate through a particular layout if you don't know what the components of that layout are? If you don't know the components inside the layout, you do not know the distance that the person will travel, and you don't know the size of the interactor that they'll try to acquire at the end of this uh, movement. So that lack of that knowledge breaks the admissible heuristic or the guiding function that, uh, that uh, guides the search. And without any modification, the system with this type of a cost function needed hours or days to generate even simple user interface. So one of my contributions here was to create a novel admissible heuristic that was able to compute a lower bind, bound on the movement time even without knowing all of the widgets that are going to be used in the layout. And that reduced the, the time necessary to generate user interfaces to seconds or minutes. But I'm going to skip the details. Uh, moving on to how well it worked, actually. Uh, this is an example of a user interface copied directly from Microsoft Office 2003 or XP. This is an example of, this is a font formatting dialog box. Um, re reproduced in SAPL. And this is the same, uh, the same uh, dialog box functionally, but automatically generated to be the fastest for an able-bodied person to use. So you will notice that the lists are expanded to, to reduce scrolling, targets are a little bit larger, but we still have uh, tabs over them. This, in contrast, is a, is a user interface generated automatically for a gentleman with cerebral palsy, somebody with very spastic movements, so fast but very inaccurate. And you will notice that uh, in, this, in, in the case of the gentleman with cerebral palsy, the targets are, are even larger, but it comes at a price because enlarged elements in lists mean that not all elements fit in a single view, so now you have more scrolling. And in contrast to these two, this is a user interface generated for, for a lady with mu muscular dystrophy, so severe muscle weakness. So that lady needed both of her hands to move the mouse, but she was able to move very accurately, although it was very slow. So you will notice that in her case, there are no more tab panes. All of the functionality is crammed into a single window. Uh, all of the elements are relatively small. There, there is dragging. She could perform, uh, sorry, there's scrolling. She could perform scrolling very well with a scroll wheel. So that was a very fast operation for her. And looking at all of these designs together, the, the one point that I really want to stress each time I talk about it is that there is no such thing as a single disability design. You cannot design one user interface that is optimal for able-bodied people and all people with all possible disabilities. When every person has a very different set of uh, motor characteristics and you really have to take them, uh, address them on a very individual basis. Uh, so to summarize this part, uh, I developed an alternative way of modeling people's uh, motor capabilities that is a little bit more uh, f flexible and expressive than, than fits long. And, um, <clears throat> and I developed an, a novel uh, admissible heuristic and an optimization-based algorithm that actually allows us to generate user interfaces based on people's motor capabilities uh, for, for, uh, for different individuals. So now, now to convince you that this work was actually worth the time I put into it. Oh, no, actually, uh, I forgot that I added this one section, which I actually find uh, also very interesting. So we've done motor capabilities. How about vision capabilities? Uh, some of the same ideas will apply. So notice that today people with low vision typically use computers using screen magnifiers. This is what it would look like. A person sees only a fraction of a user interface at a time. And unlike us who can scan the entire user interface in parallel using the, the most powerful uh, aspect of our visual system, people with uh, low vision actually have to uh, scan user, in, user interfaces uh, serially. Um, 
why, why, why do they have to resort to screen magnifiers? Don't we, don't we have other solutions? We've all, we have all heard of, we have all heard of uh, the large fonts setting in certain operating systems. Well, when we turn it on, this is what we get. Um, and I think this picture actually um, points to, to, to something very, very um, important in the decisions that we've made in our software engineering practice. Like it is actually currently, the, the way we build user interfaces these days, it is not possible to, to parameterize a user interface you know, by, by with, with the size of the, of the visual cues. It, should, it would be actually relatively quite easy to relay out a user interface if we chose a different font, but the way we choose to build our software these days makes it impossible. Well, so again, my system provides an alternative approach over here. Uh, this, day, this time I put the user entirely in control and I let them choose the size of the visual cues that are most appropriate to them. And like in some browsers, my system will actually regenerate the, the page and relay it out using the size of the visual cue uh, as a constraint for, for how it should generate the user interface. So the person can choose the type of user interface that is most appropriate to, to their particular needs. So to kind of reflect on, on, the, on the last two sections, uh, we modified the uh, user interface generation process to adapt to people's motor capabilities by changing the cost function. We adapted this process to people's vision capabilities by modifying the constraints, the constraints on the sizes of the visual cues. And notice that these two approaches naturally combine, allowing us to generate user interfaces that can adapt to people with both vision and motor uh, impairments. And this is extremely important because today's uh, assistive technologies do not, uh, do not support that particular combination of, uh, of impairments. So, the summative user study. I run it in two parts. In the first part, um, I elicited people's preferences and, uh, and uh, motor capabilities. And in the second part, I evaluated a, lot, a number of different user interface designs. So 11 people with motor impairments participated in the, in the study, as well as six able-bodied controls. Uh, people with motor impairments were invited to use any type of input devices they wanted, but they all chose in this study to use either a trackball or a mouse, uh, which is actually uh, quite typical. People tend to avoid expensive assistive technologies unless they really cannot help it. Um, and in the first part, they first performed the preference elicitation tasks, then the uh, motor ability elicitation tasks and in the and that part took 20 minutes for people for able-bodied people and up to 90 people for people with motor impairments so that was one of the reasons why the study was divided into two separate days and in the second part of the study people saw three different applications the synthetic application that I designed to have a variety of different types of interactors uh, the, the font dialog box that you've seen before as well as the print dialog box also copied from Microsoft Word and for each of these applications, they saw three interface variants. So they saw the default variant copied from existing, existing software, a variant automatically generated based on their uh, stated preferences, and a variant automatically generated based on their measured capabilities. And the tasks were designed in such a way as to uh, emphasize all, only the mechanical properties of the user interface and eliminate uh, as much of the visual or, or cognitive effort as possible. So the only place where people had to perform visual search was inside the lists or combo boxes when they were looking for a particular item. Um, so people perform six tasks, such, tasks such which with each of the interface variants, and there were nine of them, three applications times three interface variants. And um, we made sure that all of the interface variants belonging to the same application were done uh, in contiguous blocks, but obviously we uh, counterbalanced the, the order. Uh, it was a factorial design with impairment obviously being between subject factor and interface variant being a within subject factor. Uh, and we collected the, the usual measures, times, errors, and, uh, and, and satisfaction responses. Um, looking at the speed of interaction, oh yeah, to, to introduce these graphs, uh, I'm. On this side, I'm always going to show the results for able-bodied people. On this side, results for people with motor impairments. In green, you will see the ability-based user interfaces. In yellow, the preference-based and the defaults are in red. 
So over here, you can see that able-bodied people were generally much faster than people uh, with motor impairments. That's not surprising. But also, you will see that both groups were significantly faster with, uh, with automatically generated user interfaces, especially the ability-based user interfaces. Looking at these performance differences, it's actually interesting to think about where these differences came from. And generally, when we interact with the user interface, there are two types of things that we do, two types of motions. One is to navigate from one part of the user interface to another, and one is to actually make uh, selections and manipulations with individual widgets. So when we divide these times, it turns out that there was no significant difference in the time people took to navigate through these user interfaces, but there was a huge difference in how much time they took to interact with the individual widgets. And when you look at some example user interfaces, it kind of becomes clear where it came from. So um, my system generated user interfaces with lists rather than combo boxes, uh, button stacks rather than some other combo boxes, um, lists instead of, instead of uh, spinners, uh, and so on. And notice that even though the automatically generated user interfaces tended to be much larger than the original user interfaces, people still navigated in the same amount of time because uh, the larger targets compensated for the larger distances they needed to travel. Um, interestingly, the error rates dropped drastically for all users with the automatically generate us generated user interfaces. Um, and subjectively, people with motor impairments felt that automatically generated user interfaces were much less physically demanding than, uh, than the defaults, but uh, kind of unsurprisingly, able-bodied people did not perceive the same difference. Uh, from now on, bigger numbers are better. So um, again, people with motor impairments felt that automatically generated user interfaces made them more efficient at performing their task. But both groups of use felt that uh, the automatically generated user interfaces were easier to use than the defaults. And one fun result is that uh, able-bodied people felt that ability-based user interfaces were significantly less visually attractive than the originals, um, so that they were uglier. Uh, but people with motor impairments saw absolutely no difference here, which kind of emphasized the fact that uh, whether or not something is beautiful is, is a very subjective thing and also uh, emphasizes the fact that if you give people something that really makes their lives better, they're, they're, they're predisposed to like it. As was uh, the case with one of my, one of my participants, that participant um, has severe cerebral palsy. He doesn't have very good control of any of his limbs, so he uses uh, his chin to control the trackball and he uses a head-mounted wand to type on the keyboard. So, Keyboard shortcuts are actually very inconvenient for him uh, as well. Um, and he also has severely impaired speech, so he cannot use speech recognition software either. However, despite all of this, he's a CS major, he's got a degree in computer science, and he's working as an independent IT consultant. And uh, he tends to put in very long hours to compensate for the, uh, for the mismatch between his unique capabilities and, uh, and the software that he gets to use. And in, in my study, he was the slowest participant using default user interfaces, but with the user interfaces that um, my system generated for him based on his abilities, he was able to close nearly half of the performance gap between himself and the able-bodied people. Um, so to wrap it up, um, <coughs> I showed you that uh, the automatically generated user interfaces, especially based on, those, based on people's abilities, uh, improved people's speed and accuracy uh, for, for, both, for both user groups. And for people with motor impairments, they also significantly improved people's uh, satisfaction. Um, and very importantly, these user interfaces allowed people with motor impairments to interact with computers effectively, even when using very, uh, the standard input devices, such as mice and trackballs. And they have a strong preference for using these devices over others because assistive technologies tend to stigmatize them are hard to, hard to maintain, are expensive, and also when you move to public spaces, you are unlikely to, uh, to, to find these devices. And on average, my user interfaces, ability-based user interfaces, help people with motor impairments close 62% of the performance gap between themselves and people with motor impairments. So I showed you how to cast the user interface generation as an optimization and how to solve this. I showed you how to adapt it to people's preferences. I showed how to adapt it to people's motor and vision capabilities. And I tried to convince you that 
um, these automatically generated user interfaces actually do make people happier and more effective. Um, so I'm going to brainstorm about some of the things that one can do with these types of th technologies in the future and do feel free to, you know, w we can turn it into a discussion from now on. Uh, so one very interesting area is actually, I, I think, the, the healthcare delivery in developing countries. So one of the challenges in developing regions is that healthcare is provided by only partially by doctors, but otherwise by only partially trained personnel like nurses. Um, and in order to, to make this robust, uh, the World, World Health Organization has developed a number of uh, kind of medical procedures. You can think of them as algorithms or decision trees that these people follow when, when their interactions with, with patients. And these decision trees are presented as pretty thick booklets that, that the providers have to consult as they interact with the patient. And because they're, they're so big and unwieldy and s slow to use, uh, they're, they're actually often abundant, which results in lower quality care. So recent work by, by a colleague of mine uh, demonstrated that when you actually deploy the same algorithm, the same decision tree support, uh, decision support process on a PDA where, where, where the PDA displays only one question at a time, one interaction at a time, it actually Im improved the adoption of this of, of the of the protocol and resulted in higher quality care, and it also uh, have the time necessary for for training personnel to to use these protocols. So this you know creates an, an amazing opportunity, but there are also challenges. So one one of the challenges is that new protocols like that are being generated all the time. Existing protocols get get modified several uh, several times a year. Um, and also, these protocols have to be used by people in both rural areas and, and in cities. In cities, people will be using laptops. In small towns, they'll be using PDAs, most likely. In very rural areas, they'll have to fall back to paper. Uh, and also, they, they'll have diversity of skills and languages and medical expertise. So in this situation, we would like to allow doctors to create kind of a model of, 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 of such an interaction once and then have the appropriate variety of user interfaces, including those for, for the paper booklets, generated automatically and distributed to appropriate places. Um, so kind of looking more generally at the role of a designer in this process, previously people working on model-based user interfaces assumed that the design process would start with the designer building the functional specification of the, of the entire interaction. And I think it's unreasonable. I th uh, because this is not how designers operate, and you actually know it better than anybody else. Um, so I think it would be very interesting to, to develop tools that actually observe designers uh, create a number of prototypes of, of, of a particular interaction, which is how designers operate, and from, by observing this interaction, infer the appropriate underlying model, and then use that model to provide alternative versions of uh, of the interactions for, for novel devices and so on. But more important, uh, more interestingly, I, I think everything that I've told you about so far was about adapting the presentation of the functionality. I think it's very interesting to think about adapting the contents, uh, I mean, the, the actual functionality itself. So for example, when we, when we want to move interactions to mobile devices, we not only want to make things smaller, but we actually want to make things simpler want to take away functionality. Also, um, as Joanna McGreenery and others have shown, it, when, when you simplify software, people tend to interact with this more effectively and also prefer it much more. So, you know, she cited the example of Microsoft Word, which currently su supports the needs of very diverse populations. And from available data, any one of us uses between five and 15% of the functionality available in Word, but each one of us uses different 5 to 15% of that functionality. So wouldn't it be nice if we could actually have a simplified, personalized, and kind of targeted to a particular task view of, of, that, um, of that application that is particularly effective for we, what we do? And uh, I think it, for that problem, would be v it would be very interesting to try to leverage communities. So one approach would be to do what the gaming people do, which is to actually build sub build support tools that allow communities to collaborate on specialized views of a particular user interface. 
So for example, in, uh, in the world of Warcraft, people tend to have uh, you know, dragon slaying interfaces and the gold hunting interfaces and other specialized interfaces which they download at runtime and switch uh, as their needs change. And perhaps you know, that kind of flexible uh, approach would be appropriate for us. Uh, and to bootstrap that process, we could actually observe user communities uh, use user interfaces and infer from them semantic groupings and, uh, and, uh, and, and other semantic aspects of the user interface and propose uh, simplified user interfaces that are appropriate for a particular user. Um, and kind of one last thing that I wanted to throw out is that <coughs> when we go to WIST, we often see people proposing novel types of, novel ways of interacting with computers and occasionally like for example, in the in the uh, in the case of crossing, people will develop a new in entire novel application that that uh, that relies on this novel interaction technique. But developing novel applications relying on new types of interaction techniques is actually extremely expensive. You have to develop the widget toolkit, toolkit. You have to develop the entire application entirely from scratch, which makes it extremely hard to actually study the long-term and large-scale effects of a particular novel uh, interaction technique. Notice that with SAPL, you can actually just create a new set of um, components and using the techniques that I showed earlier, generate an, an appropriate cost function that will, that will allow you to automatically generate user interfaces that uh, kind of take advantage of this novel interaction technique and then automatically generate variants of, that of, of all of the existing applications that rely on this novel interaction technique rather than the uh, existing interaction techniques. So that way we could study crossing, we could study novel interaction techniques that we are developing for, for, uh, for people who use brain-computer interfaces um, and many others. So with this, I really want to end by acknowledging my advisors, Dan Weld and Jake Wabrock, uh, my mentors at Microsoft Research, Mary Czerwinski and Desney Tan, as well as the rest of my committee and a number of my uh, inspiring collaborators. That's it. So do you use this yourself? I mean, I know it's by real type, but I mean, do you have anything that can you use on your own interfaces or real applications? Um, the, the one application, there are two applications that I use myself, uh, a, a search interface for, for, for Amazon and, and a newsreader, uh, but otherwise not really. So the biggest challenge is that um, the way we write software right now is, does not provide for, for you know, sufficient separation between the interface and the application logic. So I cannot plug into existing applications and provide alternative interfaces. So if I want to test the system, I actually have to write entirely entire new applications, which, um, which is a limitation and a bottleneck to, to really testing, out, to testing it out in every day. Yeah, first you. How do you get past that bottleneck? I mean, how, how do we make this so that it's just a normal part of the operating system? Well, so all application developers will support just um, I think part of it is talking to the right people. So I'm spending next year at Microsoft Research. <laughs> um, so I, 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 th I think there's more and more. Hmm. So interestingly enough, because of the legal requirements to, to provide accessibility uh, options in, in existing software, um, software vendors are slowly looking for ways of separating the interaction from application logic. Um, and I think that will perhaps eventually allow, uh, allow a rich, rich enough communications channel for us to try to offer you know, automatically generated alternatives to hand-designed user interfaces. By the way, one thing that I want to stress over here is that while the story that I presented today focused on uh, on the needs of people with impairments, I, I think it's a much broader approach, and you know, it, it, it applies to adapting to novel devices. It applies to uh, adapting to, you know, 
different styles of use as well as you know automatically generating user interfaces for novel interaction techniques where, where we actually don't know what's good but we can measure our own performance and then you know generate user interfaces that seem to perform well given a, a new style of interaction I'm completely on board with all of your arguments of why there should be a software solution versus a hardware solution for uh, differently abled users. Um, I'm just curious if you have run any tests to see if the best, you know, hardware plus software solutions, how, how they compare to just your software solution. Um, I did not pose the question this way. My, the way I posed the question is, how well can people do? Given given free choice of how they want to interact with the computer. So I told my my participants with motor impairments that they could interact with the computer whichever way they wanted, whichever way they th think they're fastest. And in the second user study, they all felt that they wanted to interact with computers using mice and, and trackballs. That, that they rejected all of the other assistive technologies that are available to them. So just because a technology exists doesn't mean that people will actually want to use it. In my first pilot study, which I did not report over here, uh, well, which I only mentioned briefly, I, I had an eye tracker user. Um, I, I, had a, I had a head mouse user, so somebody who was basically used, had a reflective dot on the forehead and was controlling the mouse by, by moving his head. Um, and you know, in, he had very poor control o o over his arms. So you know, if he were to, to use mouse or, or trackball, he, he would be very, very ineffective. But by combining the head mouse, w which allows him to very accurately acquire targets of you know, certain size and higher, but not really tiny spinners. He, you know, that combination of, of, of a particular hardware technology plus my software was the effective uh, combination. Yes, sir, and then there. So can you talk a little about how a radically different modality like speech or a multimodal interaction might play into this framework? Um, so another extension of SAPL actually incorporates speech. Um, so we already have some ideas of how, how to use speech for, for interacting with graphical user interfaces. I mean, all of the elements are named and you can, you, you can interact with those graphical user interfaces using those names. However, my system gives you something that kind of existing speech recognition so software added to, to, to a GUI do not give you. So for example, in many user interfaces, you've got ambiguity. You've got a number of elements with the same label. So my system will actually reason about these ambiguities. It will give you visual feedback and say, look, there are several items with this label, and then the user can spatially resolve them. For example, say the left one, or, or the user can actually compose uh, phrases that say, you know, I want the, you know, the level of the left light, where, where, where level is the name of the individual component, but left is the uh, name of one of the parent components. And users can also respond like, you know, I want all of them to happen. And also my system can reason about what is currently visible. So it will only, if, if in a different rendering, if only one of the lights is visible at a time, as, as you saw in one of the early ones, it will just manipulate the one that is currently visible. So uh, I, I think, you know, f f knowledge of the, of the uh, interface model as well as some ability to manipulate the presentation of the interface at will can, can be combined with speech to actually create uh, better interactions than what we have so far. Yeah, I think you said that the interface usually grows larger with your system. Uh, no, I didn't say that. So, uh, oh, oh, maybe I hinted that. So I actually, I gave it more space than the original user interface. So um, the space constraint that I gave it was uh, kind of a, a third of the screen real estate. The healthcare questionnaire on the PDA. So, mm -hmm. um, was that interface ported from a larger interface, and did it use the pagination and so on? Uh, the healthcare that I just presented very recently. So that interface was not built by me. It was built by by my colleague and evaluated uh, independently of me. I, I just use it as an inspiration, uh, and they built it specifically for the PDA. Because, uh, because of the kind of technological limitations of, of the particular environment that they've worked, worked in. So environment in which PDAs could be sustainable, but laptops would not be. So do you have thoughts on using your system to port interfaces from larger screens to mobile devices? 
Um, so to do it, you need to solve two problems. One problem is to kind of understand what the original interface does. And the second is to, to port that understanding to, to, the, to the new device. So I think I solved reasonably well the second part of this challenge. Once we know what the interface is doing, and once we have a formal representation of it, you can actually turn it into a novel user interface appropriate for a phone or different type of a device. But um, I do not think we have particularly good answers for uh, automatically building models of what a user interface does just by looking at, at, at an existing user interface. There, there have been some promising work, but uh, I don't think the problem is solved. Thank you. Oh, oh, oh one more. <laughs> there, there, there's actually one behind it. Uh, it's awesome. So you show some interesting results where um, able-bodied users reported aesthetically that they uh, 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 didn't like the subtle interfaces as much. Um, and I was just interested in what you thought about this role of the aesthetic uh, and, and that interplay with the usability, this like perceived usability. Um, so there are probably three things to say over here. One is that People who objected to the aesthetics of these user interfaces um, primarily cited familiarity. So they said, you know, when they, when they looked at the default user interfaces, they said, I'm used to user interfaces like this. And when they looked at the automatically generated one, they said, uh, you know, I've never seen anything like that. This is weird, right? So th there is an element of familiarity. Um, and then the... Then the, the second part of, of the answer is that uh, in, my, in, in what I did, I, I solely emphasized the mechanical properties of the user interfaces and sacrificed everything else. Uh, but uh, James Fogarty and others actually have come up with some ideas of how you can quantify certain aspects of, of aesthetics. And you could actually in, reintroduce these metrics into the system and make sure that they actually do play a role so that we, we do make choices uh, choices that are both uh, usable and aesthetic. And finally, I recently came across some literature that uh, generally showed that things that, that we perceive as aesthetic do have impact on our productivity, especially in creative tasks. So we uh, ultimately, we never want to sacrifice uh, aesthetics more than necessary. familiarity as, as one of those parameters. <coughs> you have an adaptable interface that's changing all the time and I, I'd imagine intuitively that it uh, doesn't change all the time uh, with with uh, uh, changing <laughs> size or that was just a demonstration application I would never give anything like that to the user I see, yeah. uh, uh, but I guess what, what kind of uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, sort of familiar how does the spatial representation and consistency over time how does that play into the algorithm so um, there are two things that I've did, done in this uh, space. So one, one thing, I actually extended the optimization algorithm to include a, sp a specialized metric for, for, for spatial and visual uh, similarity. So especially when, when you move from one device to another, you would want user interfaces that resemble one another to su in some way so that you can port your familiarity as quickly as possible. So I actually included that metric and uh, I can generate user interfaces for, for the same application that will look very much like the user interface that you've seen for that same application on a different device or in a different context. Um, and the second thing is that I, I've also run a whole bunch of studies on, you know, on how you, you can adapt user interfaces on the fly to, to people's changing tasks without actually disorienting them. And it turns out that uh, you have to be very, very careful about it. And if you are careful about it, pe people's satisfaction and improvement uh, and performance go up, but the trick usually is to to have never to never modify the kind of familiar part of the user interface, but just add extra components to the user interface that are clearly marked as adaptive, and just copy useful things to those spaces. So people have a choice of whether or not to to follow a familiar route and kind of exploit the kind of both perceptual and and motor memory, or whether to take advantage of of an adaptation. So. Uh, Although I demonstrated user interfaces that can kind of fluidly adjust to different contexts, I would never do it unless explicitly requested by the user. Uh, 
So I, I give people just one user interface that's appropriate to their context, and then they can make further choices. Scott. So the, my last question was, most of what you've shown today is widget-centric user interfaces. So buttons, sliders, that sort of thing. And a lot of what we see on the web is data-centric user interfaces. Ah. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts of how approaches like this would extend or not to data-centric interactions. Can you add a clarifying example of what you mean? Uh, I, the two, I think the two big gorillas would be the Amazon user experience and the Google uh, search results. I, I, it's very interesting that you ask this question because <clears throat> when I talk about my other work on kind of understanding adaptive user interfaces, the first thing that I say is that people mean different things by adaptive user interfaces. When you ask Pat Langley, he will understand user, adaptive user interfaces as those that adapt the data that they deliver to the needs of a particular user, whereas I'm mostly, I'm mostly concerned with the presentation of the functionality and how that changes to, to help the user. I guess it's um, presentation of data. So uh, not, not changing the results that Amazon or Google would give you, though that is, that's an mm -hmm. interesting but distinct research project. But the way that Amazon presents itself to you or the way that the search results. Are, are those things just like widgets, or is there something that makes them different? Uh, actually, I, I think they are very much like widgets. I mean, if, I mean you, you've, you can think of a number of very discrete choices. I mean, one choice is to just show a title. Another choice is to show a title with, with, a, with a cover and with a, with a snippet. And the question is, how do you decide what is better? And so something um, that there's a very interesting recent paper that came out from somebody who used to be at Amazon and is now at Microsoft Research, I think is Ronnie Kohavi. And he was talking about, you know, how do you automate experimentation on the web? So one very interesting thought is that, you know, you could use a particular type of, of user behavior as your, as your optimization metric. So you could kind of try to try a few different things, try to build a model of how different design choices influence, for example, a person's buying pattern or a person's willingness to contribute information to a particular uh, you know, community system or something else, and then make designs that, that you predict will maximize that particular desirable user behavior. So uh, I, I think it is an extremely exciting area to look into, and some of the, th some of the ideas will port, others will have to be invented from scratch. For information on other online Stanford seminars and courses, please visit study.stanford.edu. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.